Hi guys, uh, welcome to the webinar. Today we're going to be going through better business processes. Uh, my name is Jake Rankin. I'm a sales engineer here at Intraface, and also here with me is Andy Naylor, our support manager. Hi guys, uh, if you've got any questions throughout the webinar, just put them in the box provided and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of each section. Okay, so we are the top partner for Bitrix in terms of the number of projects that we deliver for them. We're located in Sheffield, England and New York. What we can offer is pre-sales services from scoping out your requirements, implementing your system, training you and then offering you ongoing support on that system so we always have the, the, uh, the structure to offer you a workable solution for your business. Also we have just opened up an, an office in Dubai as well so I just missed that off there. So uh, just what is Bitrix? So Bitrix um, is a collaboration platform. It has an excess of 35 tools which can assist your business functions. It now has over 2 million businesses registered worldwide using the software. What we can offer it is a cloud version, which is a monthly subscription, or a self-hosted version for essentially a, a one-off fee. So just what are business processes and why would you necessarily you know, use Bitrix to, uh, to carry them out? So the business process module within Bitrix 24 allows organizations to execute and monitor workflows and documents, say HR items, leads, tasks, and expense submissions also. There are also, uh, just to touch on, there are two different types of business processes. We've got sequential and state driven. Um, and Andy is going to uh, show us the difference between them now. So in Bitrix, there are two types of business process. The first one we'll look at is a sequential business process. Uh, and this is what is on the screen at the moment. So a sequential business process has a predefined start point as you can see here. And then it performs a series of different actions that we can drag in from the right-hand panel. Uh, and then at the end of the business process, it does have a, a predefined endpoint where the business process will stop running. Now, these business processes can be triggered, for example, uh, if this was to be run on a deal. It can be triggered when a new deal has been created. It could be triggered when a new deal has been edited, and it also can be manually triggered. The other type of business process within Bitrix is a state-driven business process. Now, this does not have any predefined start or end points. Instead, it has a series of different statuses that can trigger a child business process. So the example that you can see on the screen here is to do with the status of a document in a document drive. And what we can do is say, for example, this document had the status of approval, then it would trigger this business process. So you can see here that there's a child sequential business process within this state-driven business process. So once a document has a status of approved, it will send an email out, and you can see here, if it's been approved, then it will set the status of the document to published, and if it's not, then it will set the status to draft. So now, uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at how business processes are, are first of all managed, uh, where they can be run, um, and then where they can be created. And he's going to show us um, as well how we can trigger them and what the, what the, uh, the process actually does when we trigger them. In the cloud, um, we can use processes in HR, CRM and lists, whereas within the self-hosted, you have a few extra options and a few extra areas like we can run them from the back of, say, tasks, user profiles and also custom processes, which we can run through and show you. So Andy is now just going to show us the, uh, the location of the processes. So we're now going to have a look at where we can run business processes from within Bitrix. So the first port of call is going to be on the activity stream. So if you're on a paid version of Bitrix, you will have access to these. We just need to click on the more, click on workflow, and then you will see a list of the available workflows to trigger a business process. So. One example that comes standard with Bitrix is the leave approval. We have a form here that we can fill out, press send, 
and then that will trigger a business process. Now, if you don't see any workflows and you're on a paid version of Bittrex, you just need to go to workflows in the left hand side. Click on workflows in the activity stream. And then you'll see in the top right hand corner here, we have some, something that says workflows directory. If you click on that, then you can see these are the five standard workflows that are available uh, free of charge on Bittrex. Uh, if these aren't installed, you'll see a green button here that just says install. You just need to click that and it will install. So the activity stream is the first place we can run business processes from. The second is within the CRM. So each CRM element has the possibility to manually trigger a business process off. Now we can look into companies. And if we go into a company, for example, we can go into Techco. And you'll see in the bottom here, we have a tab called business processes. Now, as I mentioned, this tab is available in companies, which we're in at the moment, contacts, leads and deals. And what it allows you to do, it allows you to manually run a business process within this particular company. So we can say here and if we clicked on new case, then that would pull up a form that we've created within the business process itself. Uh, we would need to populate this form, press start, and it would trigger a business process. So that is the second place that we can run business processes from. Uh, the third place is the lists module on Bittrex. So we can create a uh, our own uh, list within Bittrex. Again, Bittrex does come with a, a few standard lists such as purchases and leave requests, I do believe. And again, uh, we can install these. But basically, a list is something that we can submit to and it will trigger a business process. So in this case, we've got a test version here. We click on add. It will provide us a form. This is the form here that we would need to fill out. And once we've done so, it will trigger a new business process off and populate the form that you see on uh, sorry, the list that you see on the screen here. So lists are the third place where you can run business processes from. And lists aren't just a standalone module. Uh, all the lists module are available in all work groups as well. So you can trigger your own business processes off within a work group. Now the fourth and final place we can run business processes from are document drives. So we can see here if we go into our common documents drive here and click on the cog icon. The first thing you need to do when you're in a document drive is click on configure business processes and if this is a standard it's actually unticked so we just need to make sure that this box is ticked as soon as it is click save and you will then see business processes here and it will allow you to run a business process on a document that gets uploaded to this particular drive that gets edited within this particular drive or we can actually run business processes manually on a document so again, pretty much like the lists and the workflows, Bittrex does have some standard processes. So you can see here, a few of these are the older versions, but you can see here that Bittrex comes with seven free uh, business processes within the document side. So you just need to, again, if these aren't installed, you just need to click on sequential and then install the templates and it will preload these business processes for you. So that is the fourth uh, and final place where you can run business processes from. Okay, uh, now we're going to look at some of the questions that just came through on that section. I've got one here saying, uh, can permissions be assigned to processes to restrict access? So yeah, pretty much in all areas it's possible to uh, restrict certain, certain aspects of the site through, through permissions, so yeah, that would be possible. Um, any more at all? Uh, not at the moment. If you've got any questions, uh, don't forget to put them in the box provided and we can answer them at any point throughout. 
Okay, so the next section is to create uh, the actual business process that we're going to run. So Bitrix contains a very advanced visual editor tool for building business processes. Includes 40 pre-built action blocks, which you can utilize the drag and drop technology, which means it's really easy to use when you're building these processes. What Andy's going to do now is going to create a process for us, and then we're going to look at a process within CRM, which adds some automation into a deal as it progresses through sort of the different stages. So what we're going to have a look at now is how we can create a business process or a CRM deal and how that can be triggered when we update the stages of that particular deal. So let's jump into the CRM and click on deals. And what Patrix allows you to do is it allows you to create a deal and define a set number of stages. So on ours, you can see that we have prospects, initial lead, quote, qualification, promised, proposal and design, and close the deal to either win or lose that particular deal. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a business process that is triggered each time a stage is updated. So for example, if we go from initial lead to qualification, the business process is going to check what stage it's been updated to and perform the actions below that particular stage. So to do this, we need to go into the CRM settings. So you have to be an administrator to do this or have enough permissions to be able to do it. Click on automation and click on business processes. Now this is where we would actually create a business process for a lead, a contact, a company or a deal. And in this case, we're gonna create a new business process for a deal. So if we click on add template and we'll call this deal progress on stage change. Now, we can trigger this process when a new deal has been created. This is what this checkbox means here when it says when added. If we uncheck that, what we're wanting is to trigger this business process when a deal has been changed. So when we click into the next stage of a particular deal, that is what we're referring to. So it's, it's when changed, a deal stage change will then therefore trigger this business process. So if we click on save, uh, what we want to do is we want to bring in our first action block. So under constructions, we have a condition action block here. So if we bring in this here, and what a condition action block actually allows you to do is it allows you to check if a field value exists. So that is perfect for what we're wanting to do. So we'll call this a check deal stage. And then we're going to have three different branches to this. So each one of these branches is going to be if the deal stage equals quote, for example, if the deal stage equals promised, and if the deal stage equals one. So to define those values, we need to click into the cog icon here. And let's put this one as quote. And then the condition type here, what we need is the element field. So what that is referring to, it's referring to the field within the deal. And we need to find stage. So if we find stage, that should then bring in our values. We need the condition to be equal to. So if stage equals, and in this one, we're going to have quote. So if the stage equals quote, then it's going to perform the action below this particular block here. Now, the second one, we're going to do exactly the same, but we're going to look for promised. So again, 
let's find the stage and let's select promised and then finally we're gonna have one and then again stage we can see closed one. Now, just while we're on this screen here, uh, the possibility to add different deal pipelines makes this really, really flexible. Uh, because if we have, say for example, you can see here in bold, we have sales team A pipeline and a sales team B and a sales team C, we can actually check for the actual stages within each one of these pipelines. Uh, in the CRM settings, we can actually set different deal stages for each pipeline. So you can be really flexible on how these business processes work, especially if you've got different deal pipelines. So in this case, going back to this particular action block, this is going to be for one. So if the deal stage equals one, then we're going to perform the actions below. So we have some pre-made action blocks on the right hand side just to speed this demo up. And just close some of these and click on my actions. So I'm going to bring in a few of these different action blocks. I will explain what each one of these means and explain its purpose for, in this case, for the particular deal. So we're going to bring in the credit check and we're going to have an approval process here. We'll have a notification and then we'll have an email. So let's take a look at how this particular process works. So once we're in a deal and we talk to the customer or they, they have an initial inquiry, then we're going to move the stage along to, for in this case, we're going to move it along to quote. Now, once the deal stage hits quote, this business process will start at the start point here and then go down the first branch. So it's going to wait seven days. And once the seven days have passed, it will then schedule a phone call in. Now, this phone call will probably be for the person responsible for the deal, and it will be to phone the customer up and maybe follow up that particular quote. So now, once we're happy that we've made that phone call, then we need to move on. And if the customer on that phone call had said, yes, we want to go ahead with this particular sale, then we're going to move this deal stage onto promised. Now, what the promise branch does here, it will check when the deal stage is promised, and then it will first of all create a credit check task for a member of the finance department. And within that task, it will say that you need to approve and perform a credit check on this particular company. So there will be a company assigned to the deal, so the, the person in the finance department can go to, the uh, go to the deal, check for the company, and then perform the relevant credit checks to see whether they can afford this particular sale or not. If they can, great. You will send a notification to the sales, ma to, to the sales manager or the person responsible for that particular deal that it's been approved. If not, it will say it's been refused. So that will allow us to say whether this deal is going to be a won or lost. Uh, and in this case, we're going to have the deal converted to one. And uh, once it has been converted to one, then a notification will go to the sales manager and a thank you email will go to the customer. Now, this is just a pretty basic and pretty straightforward uh, deal process. You may want to be able to, we, we've integrated here on the deal one to PayPal for them to send a, a PayPal request for payment. Uh, we can, obviously we can include, if you've got more stages than this, we can include multiple branches. And we can pull in pretty much, there are, there are quite a lot of different action blocks on the right hand side here. Uh, and we can also integrate with a lot of third party applications. So in terms of this particular process, it's good when we move the quote to promise to one, the relevant people get notified and the customer at the end here gets a notification. Okay, um, so just to run through these different, um, sorry, 
Uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to run through any sort of questions at the end of that section. Um, so is there, uh, it says on here, is there an action block for SMS? Um, so yeah, we can show you that later on within um, sort of the lead automation in a little bit more detail, but it is, it is definitely available on there, yeah. I've got another question saying uh, the processes that we're showing, uh, are they available on Bitrix? Uh, so no, there aren't actually any uh, available templates in the CRM like there are uh, that we showed you earlier with regards to like documents and the activity stream workflows. So there's not actually any pre-made templates. Uh, I mean, we have a few templates if you want to get in touch with us uh, just with regards to, for example, the one we've just shown you with the deal progress. Uh, we can uh, we can export that out of our demo site and, and send it over if you uh, if you wanted to. OK, yep. Yeah. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, where you can actually trigger these business processes. So on the cloud versions, we can trigger business processes when an item is either created or updated. We can run them manually in the stream and uh, within the CRM and also using webhooks. Um, also, an external trigger from, say, an external web service. Um, and on the self-hosted versions, you can use email integration to start a process and also integrate using an API. So what Andy's going to do now is going to show us how emails can trigger a process and how an email can trigger a help desk ticket. So on the self-hosted version of Bitrix, uh, there is a couple of extra features. So Bitrix has a capability to accept emails via a mailbox that is set up within the control panel. So if you go into the control panel here and click on services, and then scroll down to mail, and then we'll see mailboxes. So what it allows us to do, it allows us to set up a mailbox within Bitrix. Um, that mailbox will be active and accept all incoming mails. We do get quite a few questions whether this acts as a, an actual email service, so you can email in and out. This is not what this is for. This is basically to run alongside your existing mailbox, so if you are getting emails, for example, in Outlook, you will still continue to get those emails, but they will also be copied into the mailbox within Bitrix. And the reason for this is that we can receive an email in and then perform a certain rule on that email. So a good example is if, for example, support at intraface.com was set up as a mailbox within Bitrix, what it would do every time somebody emailed support at intraface.com, it would check to see who that email was from. If that email existed in our support user list, then it would create a support ticket. So Bitrix does come with a few standard uh, email business processes. So the first thing you need to do, set up your email box. Simple, just set up a system email inbox and put in your server address, your password and your authentication. So then that will mean that your emails will start coming into the email box. And then we can see, if we click on rules, we want to perform a set of rules on that particular mailbox. So I mentioned this, the support one as an example. It will be a simple case of clicking on add message to tech support. So once somebody emails support at interface.com, it will simply create a help desk ticket. There's other things you can do. People set up mailboxes within Bitrix to trigger a business process within a rule to create tasks for specific things, uh, and maybe CC an individual in, and then that CC person will become responsible for that task. And that email, for example, may have attachments and the attachments gets assigned to the task as well. That's just another example. There are quite a lot of different ways you can use these mailboxes and perform different rules and business processes. If we click into uh, one, for example, a support ticket, and click on modify, I'll just show you an example of how these run. So we can apply events when receiving the email. If we click on this, 
click on conditions. We may have uh, support mailboxes that say if somebody has in the in the subject. So if we click on subject here. That said uh, maybe contain the word error or contain the word bitrix. It could go to a set set uh, particular user in the in the help desk. If it contains something else, then it could go to another user. And then we can perform, like I say, we can perform business processes that we would usually code into in here in PHP, or we could put down in here for different rules can perform different actions. So this is a really good feature. Like I say, it is only available on the self-hosted version of Bitrix. Thank you. OK. Um, so we're just going to see if we've got any questions at the end of that section. I think we've got one come through, yeah. So we've got, uh, do the email integrations work with POP3 cloud email services, or do you have to have IMAP? Uh, yeah, they work with POP3. So you would just have to enter in your credentials. We didn't show it on uh, that uh, that example there, but yeah, it's just uh, you'd use your POP3 account as long as you specify the, the, the correct credentials, it will work. Um, any other questions? So is API available on cloud packages? So it isn't a full API packages, uh, but we do have certain integrations available through automation in webhooks, say within leads and deals. Um, but no, it wouldn't be a, f a full API package like the self-hosting would allow. So we've got another question. Uh, how do I send an email to a customer uh, in a specified amount of days? Uh, I think uh, Jake's going to show you that uh, in a little bit, uh, just with regards to how you can specify uh, how to send emails after a certain amount of days. Uh, do the emails rule with, rules work with Office 365 email? Uh, I would have to check. I don't believe that they do. We had a uh, when a client of ours uh, last week asked the same question, and I do believe we do have some struggles with Office 365 only on those mailbox rules if you ever want to integrate your email uh maybe worth checking out our crm webinar you can you can a user can actually integrate their office 365 email and that would then get assigned to a contact or a company in, a, in the crm so it's slightly different to the rules i've, I've just shown you uh but uh, yeah i don't believe that the rules that i've just shown you will work with an office 365 email Okay. So uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at some uh, some live examples, some case studies. We're going to look at a process for creating a new project, a standard process for leave requests, and then we're going to finish up with a process which uses automation tools within the uh, within the CRM. Okay. So if we just go into the activity stream, um, just under the more and workflows. We've got the new project process. So this is a custom process. We're just going to fill out this form. All these fields can be changed and customized to capture what information you may need to capture as a business. And then we just fill out this form very quickly for us. So add a name for the project. We're going to select a manager. Select designer, select deadline for the project, a description if we needed to. We can add a file, so just quickly add a quick file. We can select a project type. So we'll just send the, the project across, send the form across. After we've submitted the form, it has gave us a new item at the top of the activity stream. If we go into our pending across the right hand side or on our on, in our workflows on our left and workflow tasks, you see we've got the uh, the requests to approve here. So just into the activity stream again and we'll just approve the request and extend the request. 
So as we've approved the request, you can see we've been given a link to the new project, which is the project webinar here, and it has taken us actually into the name of the project. So we've just created this new new project. Here we can see the name at the top of the page, so the webinar project there. It also invited um, our. It's also sorry. It's also added the uh, documents to the drive that we inputted into tasks. We can also see it has uh, generated. Oh, let me show two seconds. Let's get rid of this view. Go back into the list view, and we can see it has generated a couple of tasks for us to work through as well automatically. So it actually allows us to create a project with the right tasks and people every time, which obviously ensures structures built in with every project. So you can decide to create these work groups manually, but by using a business process, obviously it adds this structure, the right tasks, the right people, uh, the right documents are always pulled over, so you get a certain level of service being, being delivered out to your customers. So obviously you're given the same level of, level of um, service each time. So what we're going to do now is we're just going to um, have a look at actually the business, the business process itself. Thanks, Jake. So we're going to take a look at the workflow that sits behind the new project. So if we go into workflows on the left-hand side, click into workflows in activity stream, and we should be able to see the new project workflow. So first of all, you can see a list of all new project submissions here. So as an administrator, I can see all the projects that have been submitted. I can display any kinds of fields that I want. So if I don't want to see uh, what type of project it is, for example, I can remove that from the column view and it gets removed. We can export this information to Excel if we wanted to. Uh, but first of all, we'll take a look at the access permissions behind who can submit a new project. So if we go to change workflow preferences, and you can see here we can give it a title and a description, we can give it an icon if we wanted to, but the access tab here is probably the most important aspect of this because we, we don't want everybody to be able to submit a new project. So it may be that we add the people in the project management team uh, department to this and only those have access. In our demonstration, we've got full access to everybody, but in a, in a normal working environment, we would restrict this for to individuals. We can add, if we click on add here, we can add individual users and we can select all departments if we wanted to. So like I mentioned, we could have a project management department that only those would be able to access this particular form. So if we just save these settings as they are, uh, and secondly, what we'll do is we'll take a look at the fields that were in the form that Jake filled out. So you can see here, we've got uh, the project name, We've got a link to employee type field who we could select the manager and the designer. We could select, uh, we've got a date field, and we've got a file field and a list type field. So there are quite a lot of different types of fields that you can use. It is very flexible. Uh, to add a new field, it's just a case of clicking on the add field and filling out the appropriate information. Uh, you can put fields, you can create new fields on here that don't actually display in the form. Uh, you may want to use those kinds of fields in the actual workflow that runs behind the form once it's been submitted. So that's an option. Every field that you create in here uh, is available to use within the actual business process that's triggered. So let's take a look at that. So if we go back to the list and click on actions and then click on configure workflows and click on new project. So the first thing that's important with this is that this new project is triggered when uh, a form is submitted, so when it's added. The when changed is a bit irrelevant for this, this kind of uh, workflow because we won't actually be editing any entries that get made into it. So we'll uncheck that box and we'll keep when added ticked. And then we'll take a look at this business process. So it's a sequential business process. 
So once the form has been submitted, it starts at this start point here. And the first thing that we have is the approval process. So if we click into the cog icon, and you can see here that we have an approval process and the approving person is the project manager. So let's just take a look at how we got this. So let's delete it for the moment. If we click on the three little dots next to it, we could select a, an individual user if we wanted to, or the users are available within the users link here. Uh, but in this case, we're gonna use element fields. So this is referring to the allowed fields that are, are within the actual form. So we can see here, we've got the manager, we've got the designer. We've also got the person who's actually submitted the form as well. So we can use that maybe in this process if we wanted to, or in maybe an email field or something similar to that. In our case, it's the manager. So if we click on insert, you can see it adds it in here. And as we scroll down, you can see we can give it a project, we can give it the assignment a name, give it a bit of a description, and we have the accept and refuse button names as well. If you wanted to, uh, you can show the comment box on the approval process. So we could give a reason maybe for why this project has been refused. And we could include that maybe in the user notification for if the project is refused. So in our case, we approve the project. So it goes down the left-hand branch here. We have a PHP block, which is only available on the on-premise version of Bitrix. And the only reason why we use the PHP block here to create the work group is because we are creating it for the extranet. So in our project, uh, in our project, it's going to be an extranet project, and we're going to invite extranet users into it. Now, if you wanted to, like on the cloud, we could use any other action blocks here. We could create use the create new work group instead. That's the standard action block within Bitrix. It's for the sole purpose on our project is because it's an extranet work group and that's how we uh, that's how we build it on here then we have a notification action block so we notify all the members that a new work group has been created we add the members into the work group we have a uh, drive upload design specs so we have a drive action block here so the file that was submitted in the form gets submitted to the new work group drive and then we have a preset number of tasks that are created so having the process running behind the form that gets submitted really does give it a structured approach to creating new projects uh, and obviously you can pull in more action blocks pretty easily and pretty more pretty straightforward so if we wanted to for example maybe we'll have a, a kickoff meeting for this project we could book a calendar event in for that click on the cog icon and fill in the necessary information for that. So it may be something that's add, added later. Uh, you can you can include any one of these action blocks on the right hand side here. It's just a case of clicking, dragging and dropping, and then filling in the relevant content. So now that we've done the, the new project uh, case study, we'll take a look at the standard uh, leave request process. Okay, so now we're going to look at a standard process uh, within Bitrix 24. It's a process as well that is shipped with uh, all additions, so everyone should have access to this, this process, business process. So into the activity stream, if we just click under the more and under workflows, we can see we have the leave approval. So it's a simple form, a standard process, we're just going to fill this, fill this form out very quickly. So just select the days that we're wanting off, select the absence type, and then we can type in a reason for our leave as well. It's a simple form, um, we're just going to fill it out and submit it, so send that across. So the request now has gone over to our supervisors. Um, as you can see at the top of the page, at the top of the activity stream, we've got the leave approval, which has gone over to our, our approver. So if just jump into the profile of the approver and reload the activity stream. We can see at the top of his stream, he's got the approval. Obviously, in time, as more information is posted, the more activity is posted, this, this approval will move down the stream. So we're obviously going to want to have access to it. So we can jump into our, um, our can't get my words out today, 
we can jump into the pending items along the right hand side um, oh, we actually don't have the, uh, the widget set up at the moment, but we've got the workflows along the left, so jump into the workflows. And as you can see under our workflow tasks, we've got the leave approval for John here, which we, which we can accept. So once we've accepted the approval, it will obviously be sat in our activity stream as approved at the top of the page. Jumping into uh, John's profile, back into John's and reloading the activity stream. We can see that we have had our request accepted. If we go into workflows and uh, just into my requests, we can again see at the top of the page that the request leave form has been submitted and accepted um, carefully. Also, as well along the right hand side, just want to show you that we, we have received um, a pop up notification letting us know that the leave has been approved. As you can clearly see at the top of the page that we've got the new new leave has been approved at the top there. So what we can do as well is we're going to look actually at the business process that ran behind the scenes when we did submit that form there. Okay, so let's take a look at the workflow behind the leave approval. So if we go into workflows and then click on workflows in activity stream, then we can see this the standard leave approval that comes with Bitrix bottom left hand corner here and as an administrator I can see as soon as I get onto the leave approval I can see all the submissions that have been entered I can check what columns I want to see so if I didn't want to see comments business process or sections I can click apply so I can see all of the fields that have been entered now I can export this if I wanted to via export to Excel and let's first again look at the workflow preferences so we can give it a name we can give it a, a, a description and we can provide access to who we want to be able to submit leave via the activity via the activity stream so again, I can click on add, I can add a specific user group, I can add a specific department, or I can add specific users to be able to have access to this particular workflow. So let's leave it as that. And then let's take a look at the form fields behind the leave approval process. So as Jake filled in, he filled in uh, the start date, the end date, the type of leave, and the reason for the leave. Now, these are standard field types. The approved is actually a hidden field, so it's not actually available in the form. This approved field is used in the business process that runs behind the leave approval form once it's been submitted. And this provides us a status with clicking to approved. We should be able to click on list. And you can see here we've got three statuses, not approved, rejected, or approved. And let's take a look now at the actual workflow that runs behind the leave approval process. And we click on configure workflows and leave approval. So if we're looking to the template parameters, let's just make sure that this is running when the form is submitted. And when added is checked, that means this process will be triggered once the form is submitted. So once the form is submitted, it starts at the start point and runs down. This is a, a really important block here, so we can select an employee action block. And what this allows us to do, it allows us to set the user's supervisor to be the person who is going to approve this individual's leave. Now, if the person doesn't have any uh, super, supervisor, then we can specify a member of the HR team to approve or reject this individual's leave. Now, as we go down, we can see the standard approval uh, process here. So this either goes to the supervisor or the member of the HR team. Once they approve, it gets down to the left hand side here and it sets the status to approved. Once, it, if it was rejected, we set the status to rejected. And now as we follow down, we have a 
condition action block here that checks what status this leave approval has been set to. So if it's been set to rejected, then it goes down the right hand column here and it notifies the user of the leave appro approval status as rejected. If it gets approved, then it looks at what type of leave was selected in the form itself. Uh, if it was, for example, annual leave, it would add it to the absence chart as annual leave. Now, this is a very straightforward process. This is a process that comes with uh, Bitrix as standard. And we, we have got a extended version of this uh, leave approval process for the on-premise version. It's available on interface.com if you go to the shop and extensions. And what it allows you to do on the on-premise version is set annual leave. So, for example, if somebody has 20 days entitled leave for the year, as soon as they approve, as soon as that let their leave gets approved, say, for example, if it was five days holiday, it would then take it off their 20 days leave entitlement, giving them 15 days. Now, if we just go to the user's profile, we can actually see on the right hand side here how many days as an individual I have uh, of leave remaining. Now, each individual will be able to click to their profile and actually see this on their profile. So it uh, negates any requests for how many days, asking how many days they've got left throughout the year. And you can actually book half days. Uh, so you can book uh, from, for example, a Monday, Monday afternoon off, and it will cost us 0.5, as you can see here on the right hand side. So that is for the on-premise version only. Uh, if you want it, you just have to pop to interface.com, take a look at the shop and extensions, and it will be there. Okay, so we're now just going to look at the, uh, the final case study uh, on lead automation. So finally, we're going to have a look at some automation within the CRM. So just going to jump into um, the CRM quickly and firstly into the leads feature. So what we can do inside leads is we can create a level of automation inside them um, or actually inside the deal stage as well, so not just a lead. So just going to jump into the lead quickly. And if we go to scroll under the lead and click under the automation tab, we can see the stages of the lead are then replicated down the bottom here. So when a lead stage is updated, these rules or actions down the bottom will be performed or executed. So just to explain it to you a little bit, in this example, in the valuing stage, what we're going to do is we're going to target the user, first of all, with a Facebook advertisement. Then we're going to send them an email message via the details we'll have captured at the top of the page. Then what we're going to do is we're going to wait three days before assigning the lead to a more senior sales response representative. Sorry, excuse me, excuse me, my words out there. And then we're going to wait another three days before leaving the call on hold, which will inform the customer with a robo call that will let them know they've got a lead on hold with us. Wait seven days before before converting the lead for us to uh, to close it down or, or rather convert it if the, if the customer provides more details. So you can update the status manually simply by clicking into the actual lead status or they can be updated by an external source like an incoming call or an incoming email. So just to explain this to you, we'll have sent the actual, we'll have sent the, the lead an email message. Now, if that lead is interested, we'd expect some form of response from that email message that might come from an incoming call or an incoming email. So we sent the email message. If we receive an incoming call or incoming email back from this lead by the details we've captured, it will update the lead status for us, which means we wouldn't have to do anything. So we sent a message, expected a response, got the response, moved it on for us automatically. So it means your sales staff might not necessarily have to have to do much once they've sent that initial sort of introductory message. So update it manually, or we can use the external source like incoming call or email to, to, to move the status on for us. Now, if we want to build these level, these, this sort of level of automation, it's as simple as clicking on the configure automation. Come down the bottom, we can add a message for the employee. So when they've converted the lead, we can say add a message to activity stream. 
Uh, we can change responsible person, change the state of the lead, or we can even add client communications like a SMS text message being sent out to the customer, an email, an open channel message, so a Facebook message being sent to them. And another section, another uh, feature under this section is webhooks. This is where we can, for example, integrate with, say, um, an, another system. So let's say we're integrating with accounts, an account system. When we receive a payment from this lead, it would update the CRM and the lead status, which would in turn obviously close that lead down. Now, once you obviously progress through this level of automation, through all these lead stages, the final stage would be to generate a, a contact and a company within the CRM, which has already been done, uh, as you can clearly see in this lead. So that a lot of separate entities and a company and a contact record, as you can see. Okay, so we'll just have a look, see if there's any questions at the end of that section. It's got a question about how you can prevent put a, a date earlier than the start date. Uh, for example, a date will start. Uh, you would have to put some logic in the in the actual process itself if you to do that. Uh, we do have it on our extension on the on the uh, website. We do actually have that uh, feature. Uh, that code on there. So if you've got a self-hosted, maybe worth having a look at that first. Okay. So no more sections. There's no more questions, sorry, at the end of that section. Okay, so what would be the difference between sort of the cloud and the self-hosted versions when it comes to um, processes? So most of the tools that we've shown you today are available within the self-hosted and the cloud versions. So the business process editor tool, um, and you can run business process across the CRM and for HR purposes. Well, the main advantage is the option to run business processes on any module. So that's anything from tasks, user profiles, and the custom features we've shown you. Another feature of the self host is that you can then trigger business processes from, say, an external source, like an, an email or even an API call, which is obviously a, a huge benefit. Um, if you are wanting the uh, self-hosted, um, so if, if you are wanting a, a cloud-based product but do want the self-hosted advantages, then we can offer the hosting solutions for you. Um, you can self-host, but it will still be available as a cloud product as well. Um, access for any sort of browser window, which means you can always get in there. So if you are wanting to take advantage of those additional features, please do get in touch using the contact details, uh, which will be displayed at the end of this uh, end of this uh, the webinar. So just in summary, uh, what we can do is you can create business processes that can be run on documents, uh, CRM items, HR and lists. We have a workflow creator, which we have looked at, and also these processes can be then triggered manually, automatically, or from the status of something via, say, an email or a call coming through to us. Coming soon, um, we've got some webinars on, we've got the next level CRM webinar, perfect project management. HR toolkit and our self-hosted advantages. We're here at the same time every week showcasing uh, the advantages of Bitrix. So if you do want to get in touch or wanting a, a sort of personalized webinar, uh, then do get in touch via the details provided at the end. But thank you very much for uh, for tuning in today. Yeah, and if you've got any questions, uh, just still put them in a box provided and we'll, uh, we'll be able to answer them in the next five, 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.